Ma! Ladies and gentlemen, today is June the 18th, 2023, and we are here to talk about the world. Agent Smith is going to be joining us in a few moments, talking about current events, foreign policy, economics, and all that. If you have any questions, feel free to weigh in in Twitch chat or in the YouTube comments after. Without any further delays, we begin with Agent Smith. Smith. Hello. How are you? Good. You? Yeah, recovering. Oh, from? I spent the last week uh, house-sitting a house that was infested. And it was uh, a little too exciting for my taste. Infested with what? Mostly roaches. Roaches? Yeah. Did they have a flamethrower you could use? <laughs> Fortunately, no. Oh, man. That's gross. That's like a TVZ. Taryn versus Zerg in the home. Yeah. Not exciting. So could you not sleep and stuff? Uh, it wasn't that bad, but oh. I could have slept better. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Chat saying well, what you about ravages. you? How have you been? Pretty solid. It's been a... Chill week of streaming. Uh, gonna go see Trisha next, or I guess tomorrow, and then I'll be there Monday through Friday. And then uh, the week after that, I'm gonna start my subathon. So that'll be the second one that I've done, and that's basically the viewers can keep me live for up to three weeks. I'm gonna set a limit again, and uh, I'll do a whole bunch of different types of content once we reach certain goals and thresholds. And I have the initial draft of that basically done so just need to decide at what breakpoints I do which things but that'll be another big endurance challenge for me oh, wow yep well, one of the whatever. fun things mm -hmm. that I'm going to try that I haven't done before is dungeon mastering in oh, Dungeons really? and Dragons yeah I thought you already did that I play a character but I'm not the dungeon master Oh, I see. okay, I see. Yeah. Playing a character is a lot easier because you only have your one unit to worry about. If you're the dungeon master, you're basically the bank and god and uh, all the NPCs in the world. And you have to know all the rules and stuff. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yep, we have that to look forward to. And then next month I'm visiting family, which should also be cool. Yeah, it's been a pretty sure. solid and steady week. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. I asked Chad if they had any stuff that stood out. Did we mention the Trump versus Biden Twitch channel of the AIs talking shit to each other constantly? No, not specifically. Okay, I'm going to send it to you right now. It's oh, really you. funny. It's nonstop... It's AI and it interacts with the chat a little bit. So if people are asking it questions, then they'll reply to it. It's got like 2K Epifeny views. 320. One. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm yeah, I know there's been a bunch of presidential AI stuff on YouTube, but yeah, I haven't seen that in particular. Yeah, I would recommend checking this out. It's very weird and funny. The thing that's unsettling about it is how accurately it captures their manner of speaking and how the twitch chat can get it to talk about certain topics but the ways that they approach stuff it feels really predictable for the ai it makes you wonder how easy it would be for an ai to anticipate like the things that you're going to say in a situation mm -hmm. Yeah, I need to read more about AI. It seems to be developing pretty quickly. Yeah. There's a lot of... I don't know if uh, fear-mongering is the right word, but definitely a lot of concerns to be raised about AI. Uh, that was one of the things that Kukio talked about quite a bit as one of the emerging ethical questions for society is what is the role of AI? What are the rights that we would grant robots and non-human entities? that would fill some role for us. Because the pace of how fast AI is improving is pretty incredible. So oh, yeah. trying to 
think a little bit ahead would be really good for us. Yeah, there has been a push to try to regulate it early because mm -hmm. there's a sense that there was not enough done in the previous sort of round of technological innovation, you know, regarding telecommunications and the internet. So they want to try to kind of get ahead of things this time. Mm -hmm. But there's not really a lot of consensus on what to do. And also the technology is just so new that there's not a lot of certainty as to just all the aspects of life that it could or will be applied to. Mm -hmm. So there's more desire to regulate this time, but probably just as much, if not more, uncertainty about just what actions need to be taken. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a difficult uh, balance to strike. You know, you don't want to strangle it in the cradle. You know, you do want there to be incentive to continue to develop the technology so that it can benefit people and industries. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there is a sense that there is possibly much more dire consequences with this new technology mm -hmm. uh, that could afflict society if action is not taken early. Yeah, and another one of the questions, too, is how many types of jobs are going to be uh, rendered obsolete by AI or yeah. at least cut into by AI work. Like, that's a thing that we've seen happening throughout our lives. Uh, one of the examples that comes to mind whenever I go to a grocery store is how many lines of an actual human cashier they have versus the self-checkout stuff and how they're really trying to automate everything they can, mm -hmm. which the more we automate, the fewer uh, jobs there are for workers and stuff unless AI creates new jobs. But it seems like things like AI and automation close more doors than they open just for each person's job by virtue of being a more efficient um, method for achieving a result. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I mean, it is true that there is a lot of disruption, you know, in so much as you can do a lot more as an individual, and that does destroy a lot of jobs. And there are limits to how many jobs it can create sort of uh, on the back end, you know, in terms of the technology itself, the people who actually write the code and whatnot. Um, but on the other hand, you know, part of the impact that it's going to have is to lower the barrier to entry into a lot of industries. You know, I was reading about uh, the impact on the profession of, um, what's the word, the legal profession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it used to take a lot of man hours to just go through case history uh, so that you could learn all the relevant information uh, to build a case, you know, in a given for a given client. But now that can be done much faster. And the result is going to be that you're, that, you know, legal firms are not going to need as many people working on that in future. So on the one hand, there's going to be job destruction there, but on the other hand, the costs of maintaining all of those extra people uh, is gonna be gone. So the cost of setting up a firm and running it and operating it, operating it will be lower. So hypothetically, there should be more entrance into that market and you should see more competition that results in lower prices. Mm -hmm. And you know, the expense of hiring lawyers and law, law firms and whatnot is a barrier to entry into the legal system. That's a sort of pre-existing problem. You know, we do have a good legal, well, more or, less, more or less a good legal system in the United States that is fairly robust, is not that corrupt, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, which is good. But a lot of people are locked out of it because of the expense of actually, you know, using it. Mm -hmm. So if we could make that cheaper in some way, that would be for the best. And in so much as AI, has that effect on the broader legal profession. That'll be a net positive for everybody. And, you know, as regarding jobs, it should create new jobs as far as new firms being set up by lawyers and uh, the people who work for them. So, you know, it's not, it's not as simple as sort of the traditional way that technology creates new jobs to replace the ones it sort of displaces. You know, it's not necessarily uh, the production and development of the technology itself that's going to create the new jobs, it's going to be more of an indirect effect uh, that will be much broader and more abstract. But hypothetically, it should still be there. It should still be creating jobs even as it is disrupting, as one would expect a new technology to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, another streamer on Twitch named Neurosama that is a AI channel. And I get some people who will tune into the stream and ask if I'm that entity <laughs> and that 
kind of was a little bit of a light bulb and I felt like being a live streamer was like one of the more secure things that wasn't going to be replaced by automation, but there are absolutely people who like seeing what the AI is going to do. And the thing with AI is it has what feels like infinite mental energy where it doesn't get mentally exhausted to the point where, okay, it's, it's tired and it needs to just kind of zone out and chill for a bit. If it's powered by electricity, it can basically keep doing its thing. So that's one of the interesting aspects of AI is it's also getting into the art market and the entertainment market and things like that. And I've seen a lot mm -hmm. of film directors and things say that it won't be possible for AI to write better movie scripts and so on than humans. But there are a lot of bad scripts for TV shows and movies. So I feel like it can at least fit a pretty decent role, especially for people who maybe don't have the best writing chops or whatever, it could flesh out a story based on some of their criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's limits there on the creative side. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely still going to be room uh, for people to be creative and to express that and get paid for it. Mm. Just because of the technological limitations, you know, they probably in future will strike a balance where even though you do hire people out, you know, to write the creative stuff, uh, they themselves, that is to say the creators, will probably make use of AI to kind of perform some of the more mundane aspects of the creative process. Mm. You know, coming up with initial ideas or pitches or, you know, whatever, stuff that can kind of serve as the kernel for further creativity, you know, things you can kind of use as a almost a sounding board in a sense. You know, you may have some good ideas, but maybe you lack sort of a reason, you know, some kind of environment or setting in which to kind of set, you know, those ideas. And maybe AI has some role there. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure there's a whole variety of other uses. So, you know, probably the technology will be utilized, but it will not fully displace, you know, creatives like some people maybe are afraid of. I linked the Trump and Biden AI in Twitch chat <laughs> just as a warning. They swear a lot. And oh, it's yeah. like pretty lowbrow humor a lot of the time. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I've seen on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. What what's it called? A tier list? That's like a that's like a whole genre of video, right? Yes. S tier, A tier, B tier, C tier, D tier, and you decide like what's better and what's worse. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of YouTube video channel well, channels really that are just presidential AI videos where they just do tier lists of one kind or another. Mm. Where they have that president put things in a tier? They'll have all three just arguing with each other. Well, uh, they'll have Obama, Trump, and Biden arguing with each other. Yeah. About, you know, which, you know, particular entry in the list should fall within which category. Yeah, I saw one of those for, um, it was StarCraft units. And the three of them were arguing about what the good StarCraft units or the bad StarCraft units were. It was really funny. Yeah, case in point. Mm -hmm. Well, was there anything in particular we wanted to talk about today? I'm, I'm, a, little, I'm a little light on news, given, given all the fun the past week. So I might not be the best... Uh, source today, but mm -hmm. I'll try my best. Yeah, I glanced at the the news and it wasn't really rich in terms of things that I really wanted to hear about. So we're on the same page there. Uh, chat That's did right. ask about uh, a tragedy in Greece recently. There was drowning of a bunch of people. I think that were trying to migrate or something. Uh, did you see anything about that? I don't think so. It doesn't sound familiar. I mean, I would point out that that's basically a regular occurrence at this point. Mm. So it's not necessarily even newsworthy anymore, given just how regularly it happens. Where do people migrate from to go to Greece? You know, anywhere and everywhere, basically, where people are struggling, you know, because of civil wars or maybe international wars, as the case may be. Mm. But also if there's uh, economic depression, or political oppression, you know, those are primary drivers to cause people to try to get out. Mm -hmm. 
you know, a lot of people from Syria left, you know, back in like 2015, 16 at its height. Mm-hmm. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of people from Afghanistan trying to make the trip because of uh, the recent Taliban takeover. It's probably still people from Eritrea trying to get out just because of how bad the government is there in terms of oppression. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of uh, instability in West Africa right now, specifically in the Sahel. There's been a lot of war and banditry and whatnot. So that's also driving a lot of people out. So yeah, that's it's a long list. <laughs> there's plenty of places around the world right now where people have good reason to try to leave. Mm. Yeah, I think Greece has a fairly good climate. So if you had to stay there, it would be pretty nice at least to exist. And then Chad is saying that's one of the gateways into Europe from the Middle East, or I guess from yeah. Africa. Uh, I mean, anywhere. Like the routes into Europe... Uh, are not really monopolized by any one particular type of migrant. You know, people will just go basically where the traffickers will take them. Mm. You know, because what happens is that people, you know, some of the way they'll travel on their own, but in general what happens is that they'll pay traffickers to get them from their home country to some kind of launching point where they can try to get into Europe illegally. Mm. So generally that takes them either to Turkey, maybe, uh, where they can try to get across the Aegean Sea into Greece. Uh, Sometimes it takes them to Morocco, Mm -hmm. and then they'll try to get into uh, Malila, which is sort of that little Spanish enclave in North Africa. Or maybe they'll just try to go across the Mediterranean directly and get into Spain that way. Uh, sometimes they have more circuitous routes. Uh, I think sometimes they'll actually even go into places like Russia. Uh, there was a time when the Russian government was actually trying to encourage it so they could try to push more migrants into Eastern Europe. I think specifically Poland was one of their targets, mm-hmm. uh, mostly for political reasons. I don't know that they're still doing that, though. I think the Polish government kind of responded pretty strongly to that. But yeah, occasionally other openings sort of in the border do open up and they'll very quickly fill those out. But yeah, it's not pretty, basically if your trafficker has connections that can kind of get them into any one of those entry points, that's where you'll go. It's Mm -hmm. not necessarily the entry point that's the closest to where your starting point is. Yeah. Yeah, because this operation is illegal, right? If you're yeah. getting people into a country and they're not following the normal routes of getting a visa or getting citizenship or that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. But the people in this situation are usually in such a bad situation that they would rather break a law than remain where they're being oppressed and suffering. Yeah, unfortunately so. I would rather suffer where the grass is greener, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, given the disparity in living conditions uh, in Europe and a lot of places that are struggling right now, it's understandable. You know, I mean, uh, average incomes or, you know, even median incomes in a lot of places that are struggling are very, very low. So, you know, in Europe, even if you're working a relatively low wage job by European standards, that can be a lot if you're somebody who's coming from an area where you're living on maybe a couple hundred dollars a year. Mm. So it can be well worth the gamble if you can get in and work even just a minimum wage job, mm-hmm. you know, because you're making a lot of money then by your home country's standards. Yeah. And and a lot of that money you can send back, you know, again, a couple hundred dollars a year is not a lot. So even if you're sending like $500 or $1,000 out of a $20,000 a year income back home, that makes that's a big deal for people back home. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of places in Central America and Mexico where migrants, uh, well, where relatives of migrants in the United States have gotten remittances, you know, money from people working in the United States, and they've used it to develop those local areas. You know, there's been a lot of improvements to the quality of housing, roads, you know, whatnot, basically sort of the physical aspect of those territories, and that just comes down to remittances. So, you know, it has a, it has a big effect. So, you know, again, it's a gamble. You you could die, you know, and you could be abused. There's fame. There was famously the uh, slave auctions in Libya back in the day. You know, 
So it comes with a lot of risk, but you know, just the amount of money that you could be making and the higher quality of life is sufficiently high that a lot of people are willing to make the gamble. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just why so many people are flooding in. But unfortunately, the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean more broadly, you know, that's a pretty big barrier. It's very difficult to cross it without having some kind of issue. Mm -hmm. And there's been growing resistance in Europe to kind of allowing them in. So there's more pressure, sort of implicit indirect pressure on border agencies of one kind or another in different countries, but in particular Greece, to try to crack down hard on the people trying to come by boat. And so the result has been sort of rumors and scandals about uh, the Greek Coast Guard, you know, turning people away uh, or even just towing them back to Turkey, where most of them come from and leaving them there or not rescuing people who are in distress, uh, abusing people, you know, that kind of stuff. Basically all in an effort to deter future arrivals. Yeah, I see a headline on BBC News here that there was uh, some new evidence about a ship that overturned. Mm. So well, it looks like a lot of people are on board. So if there was an accident, then yeah, I could see how the death toll would, might be unusually high. But again, I would reiterate, boats overturning and migrants dying in the Mediterranean is not unusual at this point. Mm. That's been a regular occurrence for many years now. I would guess that these ships and stuff carrying the migrants don't have all the same um, fail safes and safety protocols as regular ships <laughs> that's putting it mildly are they on like heckin rafts out there sometimes oh. sometimes they're on rafts uh, but generally the issue is overcrowding like they'll stick as oh. many people as they can on board in order to maximize their revenue and sometimes they send them out knowing that the ship like won't make it or will run out of fuel or whatever, you know, in the expectation that, you know, one or the other European Coast Guard will find them and rescue them mm. when they see that they're in distress. But, you know, that's not always the case. And in any case, you know, it may be that the ship sinks before the Coast Guard can find them. Mm -hmm. So it's just a very dangerous endeavor overall like if you go to i know you're in the middle of the match right now but if you go to the bbc world news main page the top headline has to, shows a picture here of the ship in question and you can see just how jam-packed it is mm -hmm. and it's not a it's not a big boat either or at least not an overly large one so it's easy to see how a lot of people could have died when it went down mm -hmm. Yeah, traffickers are not are not really big on safety. It's not really their thing. Mm -hmm. They're mostly in it for the money. So you know they're they're quite content to pass on risk to their consumers. Yeah, as long as they get paid whenever they're leaving, they don't care. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more uh, demand than there is supply, so it's very much a seller's market as far mm -hmm. as uh, human trafficking. But yeah, without reading too much more into it, or I guess in the case of the questioner, not knowing what specific incident they're talking about, I can't comment too much more on it. We have learned that this migration type of thing happens very often and that it's usually high danger level. Yeah. The US-Mexico migration, I don't think is maybe as physically dangerous from natural disasters because I don't think you need to take a boat, but you do still have to deal with like drug cartels and stuff. So it's not exactly a pleasant journey. Unfortunately not. Let's see. Oh, here we go. So did people in chat have anything else in mind? Yeah, they said, um, that after 40 years of governance and so forth, China declared that it has officially lifted 700 million people out of poverty. So Wait, who? China. Oh. Yeah. 
Well, wouldn't surprise me. You know, the, the uh, amount of economic development over the past couple of decades has been immense. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, it's one of the biggest uh, victories for in the fight against poverty, you know, of all time. So you kind of got to give them credit there. Mm. Yeah, certainly living conditions have improved. Having a little more trouble more recently, but that's not surprising. Mm. You know, once your economy gets large enough, you kind of get into an area of diminishing returns where the easy economic gains have been made and further gains become increasingly difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where China is right now. It's a lot easier to develop an economy when uh, you've got a lot of catch up growth to do. Just when your economy is well behind global norms, you know, the global average, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do just to catch up to the average that'll generate economic growth. Mm -hmm. But once you get there, you know, beyond that, if you want further growth, you've really got to develop good institutions, good governance, uh, human capital, you know, all that sort of soft stuff. And that's a lot more difficult to do. You know, China struggles with that a bit. You know, overall, its government is relatively professional as far as economic development, but uh, especially since Xi Jinping came in, there's been a lot of issues with uh, political culture, you might say. You know, the political culture in China has historically had issues with corruption, you know, corrupt mandarins being a historical case in point. You might think the communist seizing power would have uh, dealt with that, but no, you know, that kind of culture kind of transcends uh, politics. You know, it kind of gets passed down regardless. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to defeat unless you're willing to just really thoroughly try to root it out. But uh, the political incentives are always, well, maybe not always, but invariably end up sabotaging it. You know, if you have the power to uh, fight corruption, then you also have the power to go after your political rivals. And lots of people in Chinese political history have used that power, have not been able to resist using that power to do so. Mm -hmm. And so anti-corruption drives invariably become more about score settling and ladder climbing than about actually fighting corruption and changing the political culture for the better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all of that is again, relevant because uh, it undermines the development of strong independent institutions in China that can impartially uh, address disputes, say, in the commercial sector and uh, create a robust environment for entrepreneurship and economic activity more broadly. So until they can really do that, they're probably not going to be able to unlock the next level of economic growth that they're going to need in order to really push their economy beyond middle income status and into upper income status. So yes, they've done well in fighting poverty, but uh, that was the easy part. <laughs> yeah, It was difficult, but that was the easy part compared to what's coming. So we'll see if they manage to finagle it. Chad also asked about a US to China visit. Yeah, Anthony Blinken is over there. Secretary of State. Hmm. Yeah, they, they, they were planning on talking like back in February, I think. Mm -hmm. But then the balloon thing happened. Oh. <laughs> so they had to cancel it. You know, that was, I don't even think they really wanted to cancel it. I think that's just one of those things where they had to in order to, you know, not look weak, quote unquote, which is a thing in US politics, if not, you know, politics in general. And the result is that the visit was delayed some months. So, you know, I said at the time they would probably end up rescheduling it just later when the whole balloon thing had calmed down and when things were sort of more ripe for uh, impartial conversation. But as was, it ended up taking more months than I expected. I would have thought they'd done it sooner, but now they're, fin now they're finally getting around to it and they can kind of get back on track. So we'll see what they do. Um, you know. I was reading an article about it, and supposedly they're going to talk about, uh, well, obviously the tensions in the relationship, you know, especially regarding trade and Taiwan, but they're also supposed to talk about stuff like uh, human rights and, you know, whatnot, which basically any U.S. government is obliged to talk about that stuff, regardless of how much or how little it actually cares about it. So probably they'll phone that in. Mm. 
-hmm. I don't expect them to push too hard on it. There's not a lot of leverage the US, U.S. has there anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as national security issues uh, like Taiwan and as far as economic issues like trade, there will probably be much more focus and uh, there may actually be some horse trading there that results in some kind of agreement or at least traction on an agreement. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's uh, in the process of happening now, I believe. So we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. That remains to be seen. It's certainly something the Biden administration has been pushing for for a while, because I think in general, neither government is too thrilled about the state of relations right now. Um, you know, people have been talking about Taiwan and about uh, export restrictions from the United States. And, you know, all of that is true. You know, all of that are both of those things, among other things, have been irritants in the relationship. But it's not really the main issue. You know, the main issue is still overall just trade and China's place in the international order. That's sort of a macro issue in the relationship that's been persistent across administrations. So even though the perception is that the relationship has been deteriorating on account of these sort of more peripheral issues, uh, they're actually more symbolic than anything. You know, the core issues are what's really uh, at issue, and that's probably what they're going to focus on. And I'm sure there's going to be pressure to try to come to an agreement on account of the peripheral issues. You know, I'm sure they want to go out of their way to try to illustrate uh, and provide some kind of symbolic gesture to show that relations are improving in order to improve sentiment and try to give some indication to the broader global community that relations are stabilizing and that by extension, uh, markets will hopefully calm down a bit, you know, be a little more confidence mm -hmm. in the trajectory of the global economy. Yeah, lots of issues in the global economy and global stability generally. So uh, anything that kind of helps deal with that is for the better. I pulled up the image of this boat. It's an old, crappy fishing boat, basically. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, there was a Coast Guard that tried to help them, just seeing that the ship was in really poor condition for being able to navigate and dock anywhere and whatnot, and they refused help, and then the ship sank a few hours later. Ah. And it was pretty far. I think there's a map here. It was pretty far from any land kind of close to Pylos, but that's a long ass swim. A hundred kilometer swim. Yeah, most people aren't going to make that. Yeah. Unfortunately common. Not as bad as it was back in like 2015 or so, but mm -hmm. it's still an issue. Ah, oh, there's an interesting golfing one. I was like, how is this a political question? What is your opinion on the Live Tour and the PGA Tour joining hands? And I was like, that's golf, right? The LIV yeah. is uh, Saudi public investment. Yeah. Yeah, the Saudi government has been trying to kind of uh, engage in a little influence operation there. Mm hmm You know, it's, it's kind of a soft power thing. They just want to kind of improve their public image a little bit. Mm -hmm. buying the PGA is just part of that. Mm. Yeah, in general, their foreign policy has been getting less aggressive over the past year or two. You know, they've been trying to do more soft power stuff rather than hard power stuff. You know, I'm sure everybody's aware of Saudi involvement in the Yemeni civil war going on. And uh, they had also been putting a lot of pressure on, say, Qatar when they had the uh, embargo going. And they'd also been competing with the Saudi... Or, They'd also been competing with Turkey, rather, mm -hmm. uh, for influence in Syria in particular, but also to a lesser degree in the broader Middle East generally. And they'd been very confrontational with Iran for a long time, too. So that was kind of part of a hawkish phase, you might say, in Saudi foreign policy over the course of the 20 teens and early 2020s. But that hasn't gone great. You know, they're sort of embroiled in Yemen. That doesn't seem to be changing. You and said Iran... basically everyone knows what's happening between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, but for those who don't, what is the short version? Short version. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> it kind of goes back to the Arab Spring. The Yemeni government had been governed by an authoritarian dictator that had controlled the country for a long time. 
and during the Arab Spring, he was overthrown. Uh, but then the new government was kind of very slow in trying to implement reforms to the dissatisfaction of uh, the liberal-minded reformers and protesters that had overthrown the previous government. And the result is that a Shi'i Islamic sect, kind of a branch of Shi'i Islam in the north, uh, took the opportunity to expand south and basically seize control of uh, the capital as well as other areas of the country. And uh, that was a very unpopular move with the Saudi government, uh, as well as certain other elements in Yemen, uh, which then allied to try to stop them from taking over the whole country. Uh, keep in mind the Saudi, so this group, this sect are called the Houthis, and they had actually been on the border between Yemen and Saudi Arabia, and they'd actually been engaging in border clashes with the Saudis for like 20, 30 years. So, you know, the Saudis were already on bad terms with them. And they were not thrilled at the idea that they would end up controlling the whole country. So mm -hmm. not surprising. Unsurprisingly, they took a very poor attitude towards the prospect of a Houthi expansion and acted to counter it. At first, they did not get directly involved. At first, they kind of just uh, gave relatively, you know, basically financial backing uh, to the UN recognized government, uh, the transitional government, as it was called at the time that the Houthis were fighting. But eventually the Saudis uh, committed their own military forces, mostly in the form of special forces and uh, air support. Uh, I, I imagine they were hoping that the war would be over in a couple of years, you know, that their support would be enough to tilt the balance, but it wasn't, you know, as was the war just kind of stalemated and hasn't really shifted much uh, since. You know, they, I think it's approaching the 10 year anniversary well, the war has been going on longer than Saudi direct involvement, but, you know, we're getting pretty close to the 10-year anniversary of uh, direct Saudi involvement here. So it has not gone according to plan. Hmm. I should also mention that the Saudis partly justified their involvement by noting that uh, the Houthis potentially could develop ties to the Iranians, whom are technically co-religionists. You know, both the Iran and the Houthis are, uh, are adherents of the Shi'i form of Islam. Uh, but that may or may not have been a substantive justification. You know, I, it was probably just an excuse more than anything. Mm -hmm. The Saudis at the time that they intervened had a relatively new leader. Uh, he wasn't the king yet, but he was basically put in charge of some key ministries in the Saudi government. That's the famous MBS, uh, you know, the uh, sort of younger guy who was installed and is famous for the murder of the journalist Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. uh, he was kind of a new leaguer, leader and he was very, he's sort of defined by his uh, gung-ho attitude. Like he's been very proactive about trying to deal with the kingdom's problems. You know, so there's been a lot of economic reform. Uh, he's taken on some of the conservative hardliners that the government had been trying to appease. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, that sort of proactive attitude also manifested as a very aggressive foreign policy. You know, instead of relying on the United States to solve re regional issues, he tried to, to kind of take a more direct approach where he and his government tried to directly address them. And uh, results have been very mixed in that regard, you know, prob probably more poor than anything. And uh, that also was a main impetus for Saudi involvement. You know, there was kind of a desire there to try to be more active in regional affairs on the part of the new government. So, you know, all of those were factors in Saudi involvement, and uh, they've been criticized roundly for basically, well, the criticism is that they propagated and prolonged the conflict, um, which may or may not be, you know, a substantive criticism, given that Middle Eastern civil wars tend to drag on a while regardless, mm. you know, Lebanon being a case in point. Although, to be fair, even in Lebanon and I, also in Syria, there was always direct, you know, there was always foreign involvement to one degree or another. Uh, but regardless, it was always going to be a tough civil war, you know, just given the conditions in Yemen. Anyway, that's the short version, mm -hmm. so to speak. Appreciate it. No problem. But yeah, you know, after, you know, some of the disasters like that, uh, they kind of are, they've been trending for the past year or two in a softer, gentler direction, you know. Not so much intervening in civil wars, but more buying the PGA, you know, 
and trying to lobby Congress uh, to try to not pull out of the region entirely. You know, there's a standing concern by Gulf monarchies that the United States isn't interested in the region anymore and is going to just completely pivot away to focus on East Asia. And, you know, that concern is to a degree warranted, you know, given the uh, emphasis on China over the past five to 10 years. But uh, overall, it may be a little bit of paranoia on their part. Regardless, uh, they're focusing more on just things like money and, you know, TikTok and just stuff like that. That's That's been more their go-to more recently. So that's basically what's happening with the PGA. Or at least that's my understanding of it. Yeah, they Maybe also would be a... bought a ESL, I think, or at least invested oh, really? a lot of money in that. Yeah, so they're uh, dipping into esports too. Basically just kind of looking at markets that are stable and have interest and are either neutral to good, kind of like you're saying, to get their name out there, diversify their money beyond just having a bunch of oil money or however they get it. And then it, it can make them look good. I think a lot of people are suspicious of Saudi involvement in things. So there have been some people concerned about them uh, investing in esports. And does that mean that we are now responsible for their ethical conduct and all that kind of thing? So it gets a little bit hairy for assessing all the big picture ramifications. Yeah, that kind of ties into things like Chinese influence, you know, yeah. where they by companies or are kind of holding on to critical uh, critical choke points and bottlenecks in the supply chain. Like how much influence uh, do you want them to have, you know, overall? So that's a strategic question mm -hmm. that comes with some thorny ethical, you know, side issues. You know, in China's case, the Uyghurs, among other things. And obviously in the Saudis' case, all of the, uh, well, the Khashoggi thing for one, but, you know, also they're famously well known for uh, the Wahhabi form of Islam that they practice there, or at least the more conservative hardliners anyway. So yeah, good luck, uh, good luck unwinding all of those issues to uh, the satisfaction of a majority of people. Mm -hmm. and that's inherently difficult. Well, other than uh, the geopolitics of golf, <laughs> is there anything else the chat was interested in uh yeah i think there was another one. Oh, they just wanted a general inflation update uh for the united states specifically i assume mm, no i don't think the questioner was from the u.s oh really okay yeah overall global inflation is still pretty high mm-hmm yeah, most of it, mostly driven by energy. I think um, energy costs are basically the main thing right now. Uh, those have been trending down. You know, that's also been a major driver of uh, what you might call disinflation. You know, inflation falling in the United States has just been gasoline prices going down. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of variance in inflation depending on where you live. Like in Argentina, it's you know, around a hundred percent now, mm -hmm. which is, which is very high. If you're familiar with compound interest, you know, that 10% is fairly high. Uh, and Argentina has 10 X that. So have fun with that. I'm sure Dagnep could tell you about it. What does it mean but if a, it's a hundred percent? A hundred percent inflation per annum, meaning that prices double every year. Ooh, yikes. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> And again, it compounds over time, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a significant increase over, you know, five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's best to keep inflation under control as much as possible. Yeah, I'm just imagining like going out to dinner and how I normally expect if I'm just buying food for myself and I'm not getting alcohol, it can be anywhere between 15 bucks and 40 bucks is like a like mid tier to pretty good tier meal. But if inflation was a hundred percent, that would be doubling for the next year. Exactly. Yikes. No, thank you. Uh, chat's hey, asking what? about China's spy base in Cuba and how it relates to the re-sanctioning of Cuba by the U S. 
Yeah, I kind of saw that making the rounds on Reddit. People were making way too big a deal about that. I mean, Russia and China already have, you know, spying facilities there. And I would also point out that uh, they do a not inconsiderable amount of spying out of their own embassies within the United States. So, you know, not that surprising in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, one would expect as much, basically. You know, if you're in the U.S. intelligence community, you kind of just assume that countries like China and Russia are doing some spying from Cuba. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, overall, not impactful. Yeah, I think news stories like that make the rounds because uh, national security hawks kind of like to embellish threats to the United States. And so they get really, they try to find things to be excited about and that was one of them. Yeah, but it could be a secret balloon base, dude. <laughs> we already got ballooned and embarrassed once. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, given that they were launching the balloons from China, I don't know that they need, necessarily need forward operating. We bases. would never suspect a balloon to come from the opposite direction of China. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's a fair point. They, they made it catch us off guard there, but overall, I don't think it's all that necessary. Yeah, I haven't heard uh, about re-sanctioning of Cuba, though, so that would be news to me. I think they're already pretty thoroughly sanctioned, though, so I'm not sure what more sanctions would necessarily resolve. What is the criteria for lifting the sanction we have on them to not be dictator communist or <laughs> oh, whatever? There's, there's no criteria. They're, they're not going to lift them. Yeah, it's too politically sensitive. You know, there's, there's too much of a anti-Havana vote in Florida for any presidential candidate worth their salt anyway oh why uh, do they not like cuba in florida the migrants I, yeah i mean it's intuitive right there was a big migration of people uh during and after the cuban revolution that brought castro to power uh -huh. and most of the people that left were sort of more middle class folks professionals what have you who did not want to live in a communist country mm -hmm. and so they tend to take a very they tend to have a very poor view of communist cuba and they've passed that on to their children. You know, in general, the second, third generation Cuban migrants tend to be less reflexively uh, anti-Cuban government. You know, it's not as big a deal for them, but given how tight the margins of victory are in uh, Florida politics, especially for, you know, presidential votes, every little bit counts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you want to win Florida, you can't really support the removal of sanctions on Cuba. Mm -hmm. So just because of Florida's electoral importance, uh, the sanctions have basically just been stuck in place, even though the Cold War has been over for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting because I know my parents have referenced the Cold War quite a few times and like just being trained what to do with uh, any nuclear threat of like doing the drills of hiding under the desk and things like that and the suspicions of the Soviet Union and the Red Scare and all that kind of thing, but uh, that was well before we existed. So at least for someone like me, I don't really feel like I have very much emotion in the direction of Cuba. I just don't know that much about it because it's been so cut off from us. So yeah. I don't really know what their culture is. I don't know why we are so harsh on them. Like obviously the Cuban Missile Crisis is, is the big one where that yeah. was like a, an immediate physical threat to the US. So I totally get that of we feel like we can't trust them because they were conspiring with our number one enemy and rival at the time yeah. and threatening us. So, Yeah, and there's also the fact that it's an authoritarian government that does not really respect human rights. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a conundrum for you know any administration looking to uh, normalize ties. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever the United States deals with... Uh, other authoritarian governments, you know, like the Saudis, for example, the criticism invariably is around the lack of democracy and human rights in the country. So normalizing relations with Cuba uh, would raise the same issues. Gotcha. In the case of Saudi Arabia, there's a strategic impetus to have normal relations, given the importance of Saudi Arabia to uh, global oil markets, as well as just having them as a geographic ally it gives you access to strategic parts of the Middle East. But none of those factors are really at play with Cuba. There's no broader strategic interest to normalize ties. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and we already have you know we already have access to the territory of Cuba in the form of Guantanamo Bay, so that's not really at issue either. You know, so you're, if you're going to normalize ties, you want to get something for it, and there's not really much any given government of the United States can you know win politically speaking by doing so. It's basically just a net loss. You know, people will bitch you out for normalizing relations with an authoritarian country. And that's it. There's like no upside there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we came closer to normalizing relations under the Obama administration. I think there was a sense to, that they wanted to improve relations uh, just so that they could try to get relations on a better tack and so that, and so that Cuba itself would maybe have more stake in not antagonizing the United States by uh, supporting revolutionary governments in the region. You know, they haven't really supported revolutionary governments much since the end of the Cold War, but uh, they have supported some corrupt Chavista-style governments, and that wasn't great, at least in the opinion of Washington. So the Obama administration kind of tried uh, you know, to kind of sweeten them up a little bit to try to get them on side, but ultimately Congress was too opposed to it for it to really go anywhere. And then the Trump administration came in and reversed all of the progress, you know, very purposely. So we're pretty much back to square one since then. Hmm. That makes sense. What are the human rights violations that they have in Cuba? Just like no personal liberty with the authoritarian government? Yeah, it's pretty baseline stuff, you know, no freedom of speech, no freedom of the press. you know, there's no restrictions on like when the government can detain you or why. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've gone after political dissidents. You know, supposedly killed a few. I was actually reading about one that was supposedly assassinated in a uh, suspicious car accident recently, or a few years ago. Or what? Actually, it was yeah, it was a few years ago. But you know, just the usual repertoire that you would expect from you know an unaccountable authoritarian government. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I know it's always felt icky because the U.S. is an ally of Saudi Arabia, but we don't really agree with them on any issue, at least from like a core <laughs> cultural perspective. But the yeah. uh, the value of their influence in the region and how we can basically sway them with deals and stuff, which gives us more influence in the region. It's like, yeah, makes it feel like your hands are dirty, but it helps the big picture for your... Uh, military operations and your intelligence and regional stability yeah i guess since we're kind of talking about it you mentioned that you don't really know much about cuba nope i can talk a little bit about it if you want sure okay gosh where do you start with cuba who's oh, leading before I... Go ahead. who's the leader now <laughs> i don't know his name oh He's kind of a non-entity. You know, it had been Castro for like decades. And then as, when Castro, well, he kind of stepped away. He didn't resign. He just sort of stepped away from power. And then his brother came in. So then it was Raul Castro. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since then, both Fidel Castro and Raul Ca- Castro have died. And so now there's some guy. I think even Cubans themselves were kind of making fun of them for being like a no-name non-entity. Like they just don't know who he is. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd have to, I'd literally have to Google it to tell you. I don't, I don't honestly know. I'm sure somebody in chat can look it up. But before I get up, before I get started on Cuba, let me just do the usual disclaimer. It's probably very justified here. I'm not an expert in it, in all of the things I talk about in, on here, including Cuba that I'm about to talk about. So, you know, if I ever say anything wrong, stupid, or biased, please do correct me. You know, if I'm wrong, I want to know more than anybody. So, participation by chat is encouraged in that regard. Uh, I don't read the comments while we do this, you know, just because I can't really focus on both that and talking at the same time, but I will see them later. So your feedback is very much appreciated. So that said, like, uh, okay, Cuba, um, you know, I really don't know anything about like the Native American history of Cuba, so I'm not going to get into that. So basically, Cuba's history really starts, if you like, modern Cuba's history starts with the uh, conquistadors. And you know the Spanish exploration uh, of the West Indi- or of the West Indies. So you know, famously, Christopher Columbus was, uh, I think, the first Western explorer to find Cuba. And uh, 
the impact of you know the initial Spanish exploration and conquest of the of the island was not benign, right? It was it involved a lot of slavery, exploitation, mining, etc., and uh, that had an extremely deleterious effect on the native population, which you know did not last long under the pressure. Uh, the Spanish were not all that satisfied. At least the initial Spanish explorers that came, they were kind of hoping for you know really valuable stuff like gold. And Cuba just didn't really have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the upside, though, is that Cuba became sort of the focal point for future Spanish ex expansion into the region. And so as a result, Cuba became one of the early sort of governmental and economic centers uh, of the Spanish presence in the Americas. And so they, as a result, kind of became their own political entity, right? So, you know, later on, you have Mexico and Peru, uh, and those got their own vice royalties, but Cuba kind of had its own status. I, I don't remember if they had their own vice royalty, but they were more or less autonomous. You know, still obviously part of the Spanish Empire, but they were not subordinated as like a province of some other larger part of the Spanish Empire in the Americas. So they had like their own, uh, what was called an audiencia, which is basically like a judicial center uh, that could judge, you know, crimes and, you know, other affairs and whatnot. So uh, Cuba kind of developed separately from, say, Mexico and Peru and other Spanish areas. And of course, it was easily the biggest Spanish holding in the Caribbean. So, you know, no surprise that it ended up being the most important uh, holding there. Yeah, I think early on, uh, tobacco, I think, was like one of the main things that they did. And maybe also some, uh, what do you call it? Raising cattle, basically. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I don't really remember reading it being the most wealthy Spanish colony within the first 100 or 200 years of uh, the Spanish controlling the island. Later on, though, they did start growing sugar, and that became very, very lucrative. And I think it still remains to this day one of their major industries. Uh, today, it's like a bulk commodity. You know, you don't you get all that much money for a given pound of sugar, but... Back in more of the 1600s and 1700s, it was immensely valuable. Like the profit margins on sugar were crazy. So you could make a whole fortune just growing and selling sugar, uh, specifically in the Caribbean. You know, there were some islands in the Caribbean in the 1600s that uh, generated more tax revenue for, say, the British government than all of the all of the British colonies in North America, like combined. That's just how profitable it was before the prices collapsed later on because of overproduction you know basic economics when prices go up production goes up so of course with profit high with profit margins that high there was an immense amount of investment in sugar production and the result is a glut in, the result was a glut in the market uh, that eventually erased all of those profit margins or at least most of them so you know cuba was no exception you know they had a kind of bull run so to speak, with sugar production, but eventually prices declined and uh, the economy kind of normalized. So, you know, beyond being a political center, which inherently meant, you know, uh, economic activity related to hosting a capital and also beyond sugar production, I don't know that there was a lot else going on. Oh, also tobacco. But beyond those three things, I don't know that there was a lot else there going on economically. Again, not an expert here, just basically what I remember. I'm giving you like a broad, you know, layman's introduction to Cuba. So that kind of gets you through the 1700s. Uh, things get more interesting in the 1800s because that's when you get more Cuban nationalism, more of a self-identity uh, of Cubans as a unique people separate from the sort of broader Spanish identity. Uh, it might be important to mention that uh, unlike other Spanish colonies in the Americas, uh, Cuba did not end up becoming demographically dominated by mestizos. You know, mestizos are mixed race people, people who are a mix of either uh, Europeans and natives or Europeans and Africans. Uh, I think more so Europeans and natives generally. I think there's a different word for mixed Europeans and Africans, but regardless, mestizo basically just means mixed. And generally mixed race people are the dominant population in a lot of places like Central America, uh, Mexico, you know, certain South American countries, et cetera. Cuba's not actually like that, though. Actually, most of the population is just uh, descended from Europeans, basically white people. Uh, there's a large minority of Africans, or I should say people of African descent. You know, those are people who are descended from the slaves that were brought in 
uh, to work on the slate on the uh, sugar plantations, if not also the tobacco plantations. Uh, but there's not really there hasn't been much intermixing basically, and so there is pretty much a dominant population of whites and a minority of blacks that pretty much describes it. So as a result, the colony kind of is more Spanish overall, just in demographically speaking, there's sort of more demographic commonality with Spain than there is with some of the other neighboring countries in the region. Mm -hmm. So that said, uh, well, I should say in spite of that fact, Cuban identity and nationalism flourished anyway in the 19th century. And part of that stemmed, uh, not just from the unique history of the island, but also from the fact that the Spanish government had kind of become increasingly oppressive over time. You know, they were not very tolerant of, say, well, for one, they were not tolerant of the nationalists. Obviously, they didn't want to lose the island, so they were very quick to crack down on that. Uh, but also, there was a lot of uh, oppressive regulations that were meant to try to maintain not only Spanish control, but also control of the economy. So that more of the economic regulations were particularly stifling. So that created resentment and that fed into growing unrest in Cuba about control over, about being controlled by Spain. It also didn't help that there was a broad uh, swath of Spanish America that erupted in revolutionary warfare over the course of the early 19th century as a result of uh, basically liberals trying to break away from Spain and set up uh, independent liberal republics in Spanish America. And that effort kind of was a mixed bag. You know, at first it actually failed, but eventually the local elites that had been aligning with Spain uh, broke with Spain when Spain itself had a liberal revolution. And then they started supporting the revolutionaries. And that was enough to tip the scales in favor and eventually result in uh, a whole gaggle of countries becoming independent uh, in Central and South America, as well as Mexico. I guess Mexico is not really in Central America per se. It's kind of It kind of straddles it. It's kind of debatable. You know, regardless, Cuba was not one of them. Cuba remained part of Spain all through that period. But the liberals that were fighting in the rest of Spanish America had a lot of influence there. And so there was a growing sentiment in Cuba that Cuba also needed uh, to modernize and liberalize its governance and that they would not be able to do so so long as Spain controlled them. So, you know, that sentiment and that tension continued even after Spain itself had that liberal revolution that I mentioned. And eventually there was some uprisings in the late 19th century that the Spanish government was able to put down, uh, but at the cost of basically alienated the, alienating the local population semi-permanently. And uh, that gets you up to the 1890s. And so that's where the United States comes in. So I'm sure you're familiar with the Spanish-American War, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, just a second. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Will Discussion with Agent Smith, a live discussion segment here at the Nerve Related Enterprises. Agent Smith is taking a few moments now just to meditate between topics as we are discussing the history of Cuba or Cuba, depending on how you pronounce it. We thank you for your viewership and your support as we try to make sense of all the things going on in all the places of the world. Sorry for the delay. All good. Okay, what? Sorry, where was I? Cuba, 1890s Spanish American War. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, so with uh, at that point, there was an ongoing insurrection, you know, low intensity conflict, if you like, against Spanish rule in Cuba. And the press in the United States really loved covering it because it was a classic story about, you know, uh, an oppressed people trying to achieve self-determination by overthrowing an imperial power. So you can see why that would be popular in the United States, given our own revolutionary history. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the press, you know, contrary to what some people might tell you about the press having, you know, formally been more responsible than it is now, uh, yellow journalism was very much the order of the day at the time. And that was a term used to describe sort of sensationalist media uh, that embellished or even sometimes just outright lied uh, in some of their reporting. 
And uh, there was also a lot of cutthroat competition between newspapers at that time that just made it worse. You know, it was basically a contest to see who could get, who could print the most outrageous stuff. You know, I think everybody's favorite example is the moon bats. So at that time, oh yeah, that was, there was supposedly a report that, you know, somebody had discovered that there were moon bats living on the moon and that they were a whole race of sort of humanoid creatures that were living there. It's awesome. It was uh, pretty wild. <laughs> Obviously lying. As the case may be. So uh, 1890s, right? So because of the yellow journalism, uh, the newspapers wanted to try to hype up and sell more newspapers by dramatizing the war in Cuba. And eventually, uh, what happened is that there was an accident. We know it was an accident now, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, but what happened is that a battleship called the USS Maine uh, exploded while in harbor in Cuba. I don't remember which port they were in, uh, but the ship exploded. And it turns out that basically there had just been an accident within the ship's, I think it was its boiler, if I'm not mistaken, and that caused it to go off. But Nobody knew that at the time, and these newspapers that had been hyping up the war in Cuba uh, immediately decided to report that it had been a Spanish mine that had hit the ship, mm. and that this was a de facto act of war. And, uh, you know, the public was already pretty riled up about the war to begin with, given all the reporting, and so immediately there were demands made for Washington to get involved in the conflict and to come to the aid of these poor, oppressed Cuban people and to help them fight and achieve independence. And so, you know, politicians being politicians sensed an opportunity to try to kind of ride the wave and uh, indulged them. That is, that is to say that they declared war on Spain. And so the United States got involved. And uh, it didn't just encompass Cuba. Um, it also encompassed the Philippines, although that was kind of a side theater. Most of the American effort was focused on getting troops to Cuba. And, you know, once we were there, it wasn't that big of a fight. You know, I'm not super familiar with the military history of the Spanish-American War. But from what I remember reading, uh, they pretty much just came in and blew through most of the standing colonial forces. Again, well, not a, I shouldn't say again, but uh, it's worth pointing out here that a lot of colonial armies that are deployed uh, in colonial, that well, I should, should say were, that were deployed in colonial holdings overseas by this, that, or the other European empire were generally not forces designed to fight wars with other powers. Generally, they were designed more to maintain control over the colony and to fight insurrectionists. Mm -hmm. So that style of force is not well disposed to take on, say, another major power that's just actively invading. So it's not surprising that they didn't hold up too well. And it's also worth mentioning, too, that Spain was not in the best state uh, in the 1890s. You know, the economy had been in decline. Uh, Spain itself had been experiencing instability. So, you know, the finances were just not there to field a fully modern army, certainly not a large one. So Spain had a lot of disadvantages. And the result is that the United States didn't really have to try too hard to take the colony from them. As a side note, I would point out that uh, one of the battles, quote unquote, it wasn't much of a battle really, involved uh, Theodore Roosevelt, mm -hmm. famous American president, you know, one of the internet's favorites here. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he had been a politician in the United States for some time. Uh, and, you know, he was very much a nationalist, you know, something of a jingoist, you might say. And when the war started, uh, he immediately decided he wanted to get involved. And he actually raised a volunteer unit uh, to go and participate in the conflict. You know, they, he raised his little private you know, force there. I think it was like a battalion or something or a regiment. And he immediately, they all went to the army and volunteered and they were deployed as a unit. And so he actually did see some fighting, but not much overall. Yeah, as it was, it was a uh, prototypical short victorious war which is every politician's dream. You get all the credit for winning a war, but you don't have to pay any of the cost of fighting a long, protracted, difficult one. Yeah. You go so into everything, a bunch of huge advantages. Yeah, yeah. So everything went pretty smoothly. And the result is that Cuba was liberated, quote unquote, liberated in relatively short order. 
this is also where the United States acquired Puerto Rico and uh, the Philippines. Yeah, we still have Puerto Rico, but the Philippines, we ended up uh, granting independence in 1946 or so, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> so this is where things get difficult, because obviously if you're a Cuban nationalist, you know, you kind of feel like you've finally gotten rid of the imperialists and you can have your independent Cuba. But as it happens, Washington had mixed feelings about actual Cuban independence. So, you know, defeating the Spanish and granting Cuban independence, that was still a goal. Uh, but there were a lot of spe special interests in Washington and also just outright imperialists that wanted to retain some degree of significant influence in Cuba. Uh, so rather than just outright granting the country independence, there was kind of a suspiciously long transition period uh, between the time the United States invaded and between the time that it was granted official technical independence. And in that time, uh, a new constitution was agreed for Cuba, which granted certain concessions, shall we say, to the United States. So this is actually where, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the United States acquired Guantanamo Bay mm. in the very favorable conditions by which we are leasing it. You know, we actually talked about this last time. Uh, but the terms of the agreement are that uh, the lease cannot be terminated unless both parties uh, agree to it. So it's not enough for Cuba to want to end the lease and take back its territory. The United States government also has to agree to end the lease, which of course we're not going to do. So we pay them for Guantanamo Bay? We do pay them as part of the lease. Uh, the Cuban government does not accept the money and has not accepted it for the better part of half a century but we still technically do pay them. Hmm. The money is just accruing in an account that the Cuban government refuses to use. Interesting. So there was also other stuff in there. I believe it was called the Platt Amendment, if I'm not mistaken. And basically that was just constitutional recognition that the United States had a kind of ambiguously defined special right to intervene into the affairs of Cuba. And that's a very broad ambit. So of course uh, that gave the United States lots of excuses, you know, pretty of, plenty of room to maneuver as far as justifying this, that, or the other intervention into Cuban affairs in the coming de decades. And uh, unfortunately, Washington was quite happy to use that, much to the concern and discontent of many a Cuban nationalist in the early 20th century. Now, one of the big things that defined the American-Cuban relationship after Cuban independence, you know, which was technically granted, uh, was the economic relationship. Specifically, there was a lot of investment by Americans into agriculture, specific, I think more so refining than the actual land, but I think they also did buy land as well. Um, also, there was a lot of investment in things like uh, tourism. I don't know if you're aware of this, Nero, but Cuba used to be one of the main hotspots for American tourism. Uh, huge numbers of American tourists would go there. Pre-missile crisis. Of... Huh? Pre-missile crisis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back up, back up before the revolution in the 1950s. Mm. It was a major, major tourist destination. And a lot of money was made in Cuba, uh, correspondingly. Unfortunately, tourism is kind of a dog shit industry as far as economic development goes. You know, you will make money. And you can use that money to invest in you know, things like education, other public investments and whatnot to try to build and develop your economy. But it also comes with a lot of downsides, you know, especially with uh, tourism. It's very easy to see the emergence of things like prostitution, drugs, uh, human trafficking, like there's lots of negative industries that kind of correspond with it. And unfortunately, uh, those industries very much emerged in early 20th century Cuba with the result that an immense amount of corruption and organized crime emerged in the country, which is not to say that those were not problems before, but you know, all of the tourist money kind of exacerbated it. So agriculture, tourism, uh, in fairness to the United States, there was an effort to try to develop other things. Uh, there, was actually a, there was actually a lot of hospitals that were set up in Cuba. And as a result, I think I remember reading that healthcare in Cuba was actually pretty strong in the early mid 20th century. So, there's that 
<laughs> for, for what little that may be worth. Uh, but overall, Cuban nationalists were very upset about American intervention, and they really wanted it to stop. Uh, but there just wasn't much that they could do about it. Oh, I should mention, the economic relationship is relevant because uh, Cuban nationalists would very frequently kind of want to put restrictions on the degree of U.S. investment in the country. They felt that American businesses owned too many businesses in Cuba, basically just owned too much of the economy. Mm -hmm. And of course, whenever they tried to make a move against American business owners in Cuba, the Washington would come in and basically threaten the government into not doing so, which is very upsetting if you care about sovereignty. Mm. So the government uh, over time, you know, tried to kind of split things. They tried to appease the nationalists while also appeasing Washington, but it just was not working. And the overall level of corruption in the country wasn't great. And there were successive governments that were fairly authoritarian as well after independence, and that wasn't helping things. So eventually there was mass unrest in, I think more so the 1930s, because the Great Depression really just wrecked the economy and made things very difficult for everybody. So that's, of course, fertile ground for uh, things like revolutions, protests, whatnot. And so that's what happened. And uh, for a while, they had a, for a while, the government was overthrown. And they had like this weird tripartite arrangement where uh, representatives of the liberals, the students, and the military kind of, well, specifically one from each, worked together to try to run the government. Uh, eventually, the representative from the military just seized power outright, and that's actually how the dictator Batista came to power. And uh, he hung on to power for a while. Eventually, he actually did allow free elections, and uh, actually one of the old student leaders was able to become president for a time in the 1940s. Unfortunately, he was not able to fix the corruption problem uh, or you know, significantly boost economic development uh, or deal with, you know, issues with gang violence that were sort of that tied into the issues with organized crime and corruption. So what happened is that Batista actually became president in the next election after that. And that was the last free election. You know, he decided he was going to stay in power after that. And that's where you get to the 1950s. And uh, really, it was sort of Batista cracking down and trying to maintain power that really aggravated Cuban nationalists and eventually led to the uprisings in the 1950s that led eventually to Fidel Castro seizing power. Uh, an important point here is that not every revolutionary at that time was actually communist. There were plenty of non-communist rep nationalist revolutionaries. Um, but the trouble is that a lot of their leadership was actually wiped out during a raid on the presidential palace. Uh, they really thought that they could assassinate Batista uh, just by raiding the palace. And they actually nearly succeeded. You know, They actually did penetrate uh, security around the palace and get inside and they made it to his office but as it happened he was literally out to lunch basically so he wasn't there mm. and uh, unfortunately for them they were very quickly surrounded and eventually all killed and the result is that uh, the revolution was rendered basically without significant leadership you know uh, it was basically they were the cap they were from the captain kirk school of leadership like all the leaders were actually themselves involved in the raid and so when they died uh, the, gov the movement was pretty rudderless. One of the few leaders who remained after that was Fidel Castro. And so when the revolution eventually succeeded in uh, leading Batista to uh, surrender power, Castro was sort of the default leader that took power as a result. Mm. And his communist leanings were not exactly well known at the time. You know, it was obvious he leaned left like a lot of nationalists did, but it wasn't clear if he was like an outright communist or not. So that kind of uh, was a surprise to a lot of people, you know, not just in the United States, but even Cuba. And uh, people had pretty mixed feelings about that, but pretty much there wasn't anything they could do. You know, once he had power and had control of the army, he was able to crack down pretty quickly. And, you know, just being a nationalist leader who was taking on the United States also did engender a considerable amount of popularity up to and including the national nationalization of uh, broad swaths well, pretty actually all, you know, the nationalization of all American industries in Cuba, as well as, you know, other private sector industries owned by Cubans. And so the result is that anybody who maybe had been a revolutionary but didn't like Castro or communism basically just had to leave, uh, you know, or be arrested and, or killed. Yeah. Not a lot of great options at that point. 
Would you like to join the revolution or be arrested or be killed? Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spoiled for choice. So after that, uh, the United States government was none too pleased with the new Castro government. And the Castro government, you know, given America's history of intervention in Cuba, not necessarily military intervention, I don't think we did that all that much. It was more just economic influence and implicit threats. Uh, but Castro knew, given the history, that there was a danger. And of course, the Bay of Pigs invasion, where the United States literally trained an army of uh, dissidents and <laughs> amagres in Florida uh, to invade and overthrow his government, that was pretty much proof positive that the United States was hell-bent on overthrowing his government. Uh, not that he needed a lot of convincing anyway, but you know that was pretty tangible evidence. So in recognition of that fact, he leaned into his relationship with the Soviet Union. And uh, his timing was pretty bad because, you know, that was very much the height of the Cold War, you know, sort of 19, late 50s, early 60s. And so the United States government was very sensitive to that fact, as well as to the fact that the Soviets uh, might station military forces there. So, you know, the United States kept a close eye on it, but eventually intelligence revealed that, in fact, the Soviets were sending military forces, or specifically international regional ballistic missiles. That was the real issue. And, you know, they're shorter range missiles, but the issue at that time is that there was not really a significant counter or early warning system that could detect them uh, after launch. You know, basically you would find out that they were going to hit you when they went off. Mm. And given the distance from uh, the United States, you know, missiles launched from Cuba would be able to hit targets in like 15, 20 minutes, like nothing. It would be over and done with before you could even really react. So that was a big deal at the time, because given the lack of early warning and detection, uh, it was very possible that one or the other country, either the United States or the Soviet Union, might attempt what was called a first strike. Are you familiar with the concept? Mm, aside from extrapolating based on the word, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I, it's probably, your intuition is probably accurate. First basically. strike is you're trying to take initiative by starting whatever is going to happen. Well, more to the point, it's trying to destroy the comp the opponent's ability to use their nuclear weapons. Mm. You know, the idea is that if there's going to be a war, nuclear weapons will end up being used if they aren't even, you know, if they're not used at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so if you know there's going to be a war, or if you want to start one, then it behooves you then to try to destroy your opponent's ability to retaliate against you. Mm -hmm. So a first strike is a nuclear strike that destroys all of your opponent's nuclear weapons. Right. And, uh, the attractiveness of a first strike is that you know if you know there's going to if you think there's going to be a war you want to make sure it happens uh with your opponent completely unable to use any nuclear weapons against you because of course they're immensely powerful and devastating mm -hmm. so the trouble with the first strike is that it basically creates a big incentive to start a war because even if you don't want to start one you may think that you're going to be attacked eventually anyway mm -hmm. and that if you are attacked you could be attacked by somebody trying to launch a first strike on you so that then creates the incentive to try to launch the first strike first. Now, one of the advantages the United States had early in the Cold War is that the Soviets' nukes were in the Soviet Union, which is far away. And even given the lack of early detection, uh, the fact that they were far away meant that there was a lot of lead time between the time missiles could be launched and the time they would hit their target. So, you know, if you have a spy network, say, in uh, the Soviet Union, maybe they could find out about it, you know, about a launch, for example, and get word back in time to try to repair, you know, to do something. You can't really, you can't shoot the missiles down, but you can, you know, take emergency measures to relocate key government personnel and whatnot, as well as to try to move your military around to try to minimize the damage. Uh, but if missiles are put in Cuba, then you no longer have that advantage. Basically, they could very easily launch a first strike and do an immense amount of damage. So this was a big, big strategic deal for the United States at that time. And uh, Washington was just not having it. You know, they basically spazzed out a little bit. <laughs> they probably overreacted. Uh, but as was uh, just the strategic liability of having Soviet missiles in Cuba was seen as too great to not do anything. It didn't help that, you know, domestic politics in the United States were dumb at the time about communism in the Soviet Union. There was a lot of political bullshit about people being weak on communism, weak on the Soviet Union and whatnot. And that created a ratchet effect where, you know, governments and politicians had to be hard on communism 
lest they be criticized and lose votes to national security hawks. So there was a sense in the Kennedy administration that not only was there a strategic threat from Soviet missiles in Cuba, there was also a domestic political threat uh, from not being seen to be taking it sufficiently seriously. So all of that led to a very strong reaction up to and including the blockade uh, that was set up around Cuba. Now I should point out here that a blockade is actually legally an act of war, right? Not every act of war involves actually killing people or blowing things up. A naval blockade actually itself qualifies as an act of war. And so that was a big step on the part of Washington to do that. You know, nobody necessarily died because of it, uh, but it did create a casus belli, so to speak, for Cuba and potentially the Soviet Union in so much as they were protecting Cuba. So then, you know, you had the famous Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, mm -hmm. if you want more details, you can kind of read about it. Uh, but eventually things were resolved more or less amicably. You know, this, the United States agreed not to try to overthrow the Cuban government, although we did not stop trying to assassinate Castro. Uh, we did technically agree to not overthrow the government. So we did do that. And uh, the Soviet uh, concession then in that agreement was that they would, oh, well, also the United States also promised to remove missiles from Turkey, which you know nobody really cared about. We were already going to move the missiles out anyway because they were basically obsolete. So no big deal for the United States, but for the Soviet Union, they needed another concession beyond just you know Cuba not being invaded. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Soviets, for their part, in return, agreed to move the missiles out of out of Cuba, which they then did. So after that, Cuba's sovereignty was more or less safe, you know, as part of the agreement, which the United States did go on to honor. Uh, we did not go on trying to actively overthrow the government, but that didn't mean that we had to like it, <laughs> and that it didn't mean we didn't, and that didn't mean we had to trade with them. So. Uh, the famous U.S. embargo was put in place in which uh, no U.S. business can basically trade with Cuba or the Cuban government. There are some exemptions there, I think, for things like food and to, I think, also medicine is also exempted. But overall, you know, you can't invest in Cuba. You know, you can't set up a retail chain. You can't do any of that. And uh, more importantly, the United States also set up secondary sanctions. So, you know, other you know, other companies outside the United States could potentially be sanctioned if they do business with Cuba as well. And so that's also had a sort of broader indirect impact on the development of Cuba's economy because uh, shippers, for example, that is to say shipping companies are afraid to do business in Cuba because they don't want to fall afoul of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I think also, actually I was reading about this more recently, the United States also has a rule in which any ship that does visit Cuba, because I think there are exemptions there as far as deliveries, so there are some ships that can legally, you know, without violating U.S. sanctions, uh, take port in Cuba. But there's a U.S. rule that says that if you do go to Cuba, then you cannot visit any port in the United States for something like several months. So that uh, so if you do want to do business in Cuba, you know you can in some cases, but that could mean that you're then locked out to a very lucrative market for a prolonged period of time. So there's a lot of disincentives for not just American businesses but global businesses to do business with Cuba, and the result has been a significant degree of underinvestment uh, in Cuban you know companies of one kind or another. I would point out though as a mild you know, counterpoint, uh, that it's not necessarily the case that without the embargo that Cuba would really be attracting a whole lot of investment. I mean, it is technically a communist government. And I would point out that communist Cuba has not gone to nearly the same lengths that say China has in trying to make the country an attractive investment locale. You know, Cuban, com Cuban communism is much more similar to Soviet communism than it is to Chinese communism. So they're a lot less flexible about things like market activity in the Cuban economy than the Chinese are. So I don't know how much scope there would be for investment. Probably uh, a lot of stuff would be cheaper, you know, just like basic commodities, medicine, you know, more shipping companies would be able to come. So there would be lower shipping costs. So, you know, overall, the baseline cost of living would definitely be lower. I would not argue otherwise, but I don't think that Cuba's economy would necessarily like fully develop 
if not for the U.S. embargo. That seems like a stretch. I mean, rule of law is poor. Uh, the Cuban government nationalizes broad swaths of industry. So, you know, there's not really a whole lot of scope outside of things like tourism uh, for private sector actors to really operate. But that does said, Cuba get, go ahead. Does Cuba get tourists from people who are in countries that aren't so aggro on Cuba? <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's Europeans that go. And there was a time during the Obama administration when some Americans made some regular trips. You know, they loosened up the travel restrictions a bit under the Obama administration. So there was a bit of travel happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, but even after the Trump administration ended those, uh, you know, Europeans and whatnot and other people around the world, they still don't have any issue traveling to Cuba. And the sanctions are not so strict that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they do get a not inconsiderable amount of tourism dollars from people coming from abroad. No, other than the United States. But yeah, you know, regardless of the overall impact of the U.S. embargo, uh, the Cuban government has basically made criticizing the embargo and blaming the embargo for economic difficulties one of their synchronons. You know, it's a very common talking point in uh, the Communist Party's talking points. They did this but, to us. Yeah, yeah, it's... To a degree, it's true, but they also use it to blame like pretty much every problem, and not every economic problem is the result of the embargo. You know, there's not inconsiderable corruption and economic mismanagement. You know, in Cuba, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, do they have any off ramps to being sanctioned to shit? Like, are there things that they could do that we would start to try to open up more? I mean, basically just democratize. That would be the main thing. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there's not like a specific set of steps. The, con the sanctions on Cuba that the United States has in place are not conditional. You know, it's not like sanctions on countries like, say, North Korea or Russia or whatever, where there's some like obvious steps that they could take. Like, you know, with North Korea, a lot of the sanctions had to, at least the harsher sanctions had to do with the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. And more recently, sanctions on Russia have had to do with Ukraine. So if those two countries would address those particular issues, then presumably the United States would uh, respond by easing sanctions. The same cannot be said for Cuba. Like the sanctions on Cuba are almost there based on principle. So there's not a whole lot that Cuba can do on any one specific issue to try to ease the sanctions. You know, overall about the only thing they could do really is try to democratize. Mm. But beyond that, like, I don't know. I don't even know that they would necessarily need to like liberalize their economy. Like if they could democratize, but then keep the socialized economy, I think the United States would probably be okay with that. I don't think Washington really just cares a whole lot about the Cuban economy to the point where they're gonna just close everything off just because uh, the social the economy is socialist. You know, if there were democratization and just some respect for human rights, that would probably be sufficient. Get a human rights, get a democracy, then we won't be so mad at you. Yeah, definitely not a country that we learn about as much because I think we have a bias of learning about our allies and our triumphs as opposed to uh, the story with Cuba. It seems like we kind of had a hand in the making of what Cuba became. Yes. So for us to absolutely <laughs> be shutting them out is kind of an interesting move. It makes sense, like, if you're conspiring with your greatest enemy, that that would be something that is hard to recover from. But I think from just a, a selfish national actor's perspective, you're going to make deals with who wants to make deals with you. So yeah. if the Soviet Union is offering things to Cuba for them to be like, oh, sure, like, that's a growth opportunity for us. And that's basically how they think about it. And the U.S. is like, but they're the villains. So then we throw it down. Well, I can contextualize that a little bit. Um, you know, certainly the United States has done, done some skeevy things in Cuba over the course of the country's, you know, relationship. Uh, but part of the reason the United States went hard on Cuba was not just, you know, because of concern about Soviet missiles and whatnot, but also that there could be a domino effect. Basically, there was concern that communist revolutionaries in Cuba could spread out to other countries in the region 
and instigate revolution there and potentially create a cascade of revolutionary governments that would be pro-Soviet and anti-American. Mm -hmm. And that was not an unwarranted fear. You know, after Castro came to power over the course of the 1960s and 70s, his government sponsored uh, not a few revolutionary incursions. Uh, he actively supported revolutionaries and other Latin American governments. Uh, he actively supported, you know, revolutionaries in places like Cuba, or obviously Cuba, in Colombia, for example. And during the civil wars in El Salvador and Nicaragua, he also supported the rebels there. Uh, he also sent an army to Angola in the 1970s. Uh, you know, when Angola was having a civil war in which its left-leaning revolutionary government was at war with relatively more pro-Western nationalist armies, uh, the Cuban government sent an expeditionary force to help the socialist government in that civil war. And it was not a small detachment. I think it was like a division or something. It's like 10 to 15,000 or so people. And, uh, you know, in one of the weird quirks of history, they ended up fighting against a, a South African army. <laughs> hmm. You know, apartheid South Africa back then kind of considered sub-Saharan, well, specifically Southern Africa, its neighborhood, right? Its sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you can imagine, apartheid South Africa was not interested in socialist revolutionary governments coming to power in its region. So, you know, over the course of the Civil War, there came a point when uh, the South African army actually sent a task force into Angola to help uh, the anti-government revolutionaries fight. Uh, and there was actually a battle when pro-government forces allied with, uh, well, pro-government forces attached with some Cuban forces fought against the anti-government forces, which had with them some South African forces. And as it happens, the Cubans pretty handily won that. So the Cuban government was not like passive after it successfully, you know, gained uh, power, right? After and after the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's not as though they looked at the crisis and thought it might be better to be discreet and try to avoid opprobrium from the United States. Quite the contrary, they were quite happy to fan the flames of revolution anywhere and everywhere they could. So, for the perspective of Washington, you know, Cuba was not just a threat to the United States in so much as it was a. Uh, communist bastion in the Western Hemisphere. It was also a threat in so much as it was trying to spread communism at, you know, elsewhere, not even just in the Western Hemisphere, but also Africa. Yeah, they would see it as just a generally destabilizing force on the world stage. Yeah, case in point, Che Guevara, famous Cuban revolutionary, was not killed in Cuba. He was killed in Bolivia while he was trying to help revolutionaries there fight the government. So that was a perfect example of just why Washington was on very, very bad terms with Cuba. Mm -hmm. You know, if they had just focused on their own affairs and not tried to uh, help revolutionaries elsewhere, relations would still have been bad, but they would not have been nearly as bad. So as was, you know, Washington took an aggressive tack with Cuba, possibly more for that reason than for the fact that, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis had happened and that it was pro-Soviet. Mm. That still doesn't necessarily explain why the sanctions have uh, continued on, basically. Yeah, because they're not then. doing that kind of stuff anymore. Yeah, yeah, there's not there's not nearly as much Red Revolution, but there is Chavista Revolution. There is quite a bit of that. And so for that reason, you know, they're still on bad terms, but that's not, you know, correspondingly, it's not as much of a tension point. You know, the Chavista populism that's in Latin America is not as threatening to the United States as, say, communism. So it's an irritant in the relationship, but it's not as much of a backbreaker as, say, support for communism had been. Mm. That could change later on, depending on how visceral the populism gets, but we'll see. How are we doing on time? I think you wanted to go to, go early, right? Yeah, we could go for another 20 minutes. Well, I'm, we might have to end things here. I'm, I'm getting a little sick. Oh, all right. Well, I don't want you to feel bad. Uh, yeah, sorry. I hate to kind of clip it early like that, but that's all good. We get a, a fun Cuban history episode. Well, be sure to drink water and get plenty of rest. That's one of my favorite things to harp on. Appreciate Will your do. time as always, and I hope that you have uh, 
a relatively safer resting place than the place you were house sitting for the past week. Yeah, much appreciated. Well, cool. Well, appreciate you, and we'll see you on the next episode of Will Discussion with Agent Smith. Smith. Yeah, see you next time. GG. Feel better, sir. Hmm.